Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Making the Argument. I hope everyone had a wonderful Easter. Today, we're going to be talking about cannibalism. I know that was quite the segue, right? But no, we've got to be talking about what is going on in Haiti right now, because the question that has come up repeatedly is, why does it seem that Haiti is always in a constant state of chaos. And is this something that in the United States that we should be concerned about? It is in our hemisphere. It is in our area of the world. But is there also any sort of moral obligation to people that are obviously suffering as a result of a very, very poorly run country combined with a lot of gang violence? And today we're going to talk about a couple of things. One, we're going to answer some questions on like, why is Haiti in this condition? And I'm just going to do a spoiler alert right now. It turns out, no, you can't just blame colonialism or the West or whatever else the left loves to blame for every problem that happens anywhere in the world, right? That's not to say that there aren't reasons and there aren't issues that have taken place in the past, but it certainly doesn't explain everything that's going on. So we're going to get to the bottom of what's going on, why is it going on, and is there any way, is there any way to actually save Haiti? And oh, by the way, does it actually include not using the government, but maybe something else? All that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this episode. We've been having some excellent conversations in our community chat, which you can be a part of by going to the link in the description, signing up, getting to know everybody. We're about to surpass around 1,500 members, so that's really exciting. We hope to see you there. All right, as always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, with me. My beautiful bride. Well, I shouldn't say with me. Not in the studio. She's still she's still out in California, which uh, doesn't make things happy. But anyways, she's she's with us. Yeah. She's with us online. My beautiful bride, Tina, Queen of the Bees. Hey, babe. Hello, everyone. We have had people asking us why in the world I'm in Paradise, California, in some people's neck of the woods. So I'll say hello. I'm here helping my parents. Uh, and so we're just... Yeah, it's <laughs> we're going to be here until I'm her, back her, uh, in the her studio. parents and I are in a battle right now because I took her away from them and now she's trying to or they're trying to get her back. And so that's <laughs> it's an ongoing negotiation. There's it, we'll figure it out. Then, of course, we have our political prognosticator and resident historian Christian Hines. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. This is a uh, interesting topic. <laughs> I, I might not want to be eating once I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, jump right into this. So um, if if you've been following news a little bit on on this issue with Haiti, people's interest in this kind of goes from, you know, opposite sides of the spectrum. Some people are like, yeah, what else is new? Who cares? Right. And, and other people are like, well, no, this is this is a major humanitarian crisis kind of right off the coast of the United States. And it's obviously Haiti is a country that the United States has invested some time and effort in. Uh, some people would say that was a good time invested, some people not. But nevertheless, it has been um, the, the source of actually a lot of U.S. involvement over the past 120 years. And so we're, we're going to ask the question now about, like, why is this going on? And the reason why I think Haiti is, is interesting is because if you look at the island of Hispaniola, right, if you look at the island um, Um, the Haiti is located on, you have Haiti on one side and you have the Dominican Republic on the other. And you couldn't, you you couldn't have two countries that are more different with respect to their current state of affairs. Um, I, you know, I'm not claiming that the Dominican Republic doesn't have its, its own issues and its own problems economically, politically, and, and with crime It certainly does, but it's a fairly stable government. They have peaceful transitions of power. They have a very, very robust tourism industry. And then you, you cross over into Haiti right? Same island, same small island. And and it just seems like a constant war zone, which is, which is consumed by gang violence, by political corruption, by um, just corruption in general with respect to the economy and the way it's managed, not to mention huge human rights violations um, and, and just absolute grinding poverty. And so how can you have a situation? How can you have a situation with such a small little island in the Caribbean, um, you know, theoretically with, with similar advantages and disadvantages and two drastically different results? And so let's start off with what is, I, I think, a very interesting history of, of Haiti. So, again, the island of, of Hispaniola is, you know, what it was called, uh, the, the Spanish you know, arrived, they began to, to colonize the island. Um, and we're just going to do a brief history, right? We're not going to go into the depths of everything, but they, they originally colonized it. Um, and then you had, you know, various 
transfers of power with with on the island where you had portions where the Spanish had all of it, then the French had all of it, then it was split between the Spanish and the French. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about Haitian history early on is that it was a huge source of uh, the slave trade. There was massive amounts of slaves that were brought over to the island of Haiti uh, or, or to the island in, in large part because of the coffee and the uh, sugar crops uh, that were grown there. And I mean, Christian, you you were the first one to, to you know bring this up and put it into historical perspective because right now Haiti is kind of synonymous with poverty. But if you look at Haley, or Haiti when it was a colony, it was actually one of the wealthiest colonies in the world. Like, give us some perspective on just like what does that mean? Yeah. So in 1789, when the French Revolution kicked off, Haiti at that point was a French colony, right? It was um, uh, Saint uh, Dominique, I think, is is uh, w- what it was called, and. At that point in time, it was the richest property of the French crown anywhere in the entire world. Uh, It produced something like 60% of all of the coffee in the entire world and 40% of all the sugar in the entire world. That's nuts. So, hey, this tiny country, it wasn't a country, right? This tiny colony that wasn't even the whole island. It was a third of the island, the western third, was so wealthy because it produced so much coffee and sugar that when the French lost the Seven Years' War that was fought almost a generation earlier, that in America we call it the French and Indian War, when they lost the Seven Years' War to, um, the, to the British, they traded all of Canada, <laughs> all of Quebec, all of French Canada, and all of Louisiana in exchange for getting Haiti back. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's how wealthy it was. Based off of those, based off primarily off of those two exports, um, and and that's just it, it's it's nuts to think about. And and it, it the other thing that that Haiti is, is um, famous for is that it was the only successful slave revolt in history. Which which is to say that we're not just talking about a, a you know you have fl- famous slave revolts like Spartacus against the Romans and whatnot, but they were all eventually put down. Mm-hmm. Uh, they certainly didn't overthrow or be able to, to set up their own country as a result. But in Haiti, that's that's what happened. I mean, they they overthrew the fl- the French. Um, they, they went around and they they murdered a lot of the slaveholders and whatnot. And again, like I'm I'm not I I get it right. Um, but they actually had a successful slave revolt, and so they took control of the country and they essentially established their own government. Um. And that wasn't the end of the story, though, with respect to French involvement, because obviously there was a lot of things going on with uh, the French at this particular time in history that made it difficult for them to deploy troops in order to try to. They know, tried to retake take, it. Napoleon or yeah. sorry, the, the, the French before Napoleon sent an army to retake it. And there was fighting that went, you know, because the revolution in Haiti started in 1791 and there was fighting that continued all the way until the early uh, the early 19th century. Napoleon sent a force to to retake it and. Uh, they were mostly killed by things like the tropical diseases and stuff like that. Right. But like the yellow fever would just constantly come back and wipe out, you know, thousands of men. And eventually Napoleon was like, it's not worth it. And that's actually part of the reason that he ended up selling the Louisiana territory to the United States because they couldn't reestablish the French colonial empire in America because they, they couldn't retake Haiti. So Haiti, it, it took a significant amount of time, right? But Haiti eventually won its independence and then eventually won international recognition. But it took like a generation of just constant invasion and counter invasion. Like at one point, the British tried to come in and take over the colony. And then there was a split within the Haitians over like whether they should ally with the British or they should um, ally with with reformists within the French government that were anti-slavery activists. Mm-hmm. So it, it was a bloody political well, it was, mess. It was over 12 years too. Mm-hmm. Like this, this wasn't something that just took place overnight. It was, it was a 12 year conflict. You had obviously the, the Haitians involved, you had the French involved, you had uh, Spain involved, you had um, Great Britain involved. Um, and, and when you look at the overall casualties, it's estimated about 200,000 Haitians died, about 75,000 French died, about 25,000 white colonists died, um, and about 45,000 British died, all, all as a result of this. And like you said, a lot of this, too, had to do with tropical diseases. Um, not not all of this was, was conflict. But, I mean, it, again, pretty... Uh, <sighs> 
pretty horrendous when, when you're talking about the population size of the island too. When you're talking about two two hundred thousand people dead, uh, understand what you're talking about with respect to population wise in seventeen the seventeen nineties in this little island in the Caribbean. Um, so th- those are just massive numbers. So Haiti's an entire population fought. was about half a million, yeah. g- give or take a, a, a couple tens of thousands, because there was about half a million, just under half a million slaves at the start of the rebellion. And then there was like 40 or 50,000 whites. Uh, and out of those 40 or 50,000, only a very small number of them were actually the slave owners. It was a very, v- very, um, you know, stratified, um, you know, aristocratic style you know, colonial possession, right? Where it was a small number of elite whites. They actually, their 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 name in French, cause I don't speak French, but their name in French was literally big whites. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was the little whites, which were like the shopkeepers and the administrators, but they weren't the big plantation owners, right? And obviously all those people were killed or driven out or died of yellow fever, right? You know, they, they either fled the island or met a horrible end one way or another. But the Haitians themselves took massive casualties. It was like 30 or 40% of the the slaves on the island died one way or another, many, again, through nonviolent means, through diseases and stuff like that in order to get their independence. So it was a, it was a bloody catastrophe. Haiti, Haiti got off on the wrong foot from the start. I, now, you could argue that it was the right foot insofar as they got their independence. And anybody who doesn't believe in slavery can sympathize with that and be like, this is actually a good thing, right? But from the beginning, Haiti obviously had a bunch of problems. But here's the thing, though. They also had a lot of strengths, if you think about it. Haiti was still the center of the Caribbean trade. It was still one of the richest, you know, richest, at this point, richest independent nations in the entire world when you consider the coffee and sugar trade that had dominated that part of the island so much that the French were willing to trade all of Canada and all of Louisiana to keep it and then send multiple armies back to try to retake it after it had revolted. So... Yes, Haiti started off on the wrong foot, but there were actually a significant number of strengths that Haiti had, which unfortunately in, in some ways were kind of thrown by the wayside because after Haiti got its independence, it spent a lot of its time actually fighting wars with its neighbor, the same neighbor that eventually became the Dominican Republic. There was actually a period in time in the um, early 19th century where Haiti invaded and conquered the eastern half of the or yeah. eastern two thirds of the island, and this is actually part of the reason why there's no love lost between the Dominicans and the Haitians to this day. The Dominicans have a view of the Haitians as being brutal colonizers of their own. Yeah, well, it's, it's also interesting too that when the British decided to get involved, because uh, the British had also had an uh, under William Pitt to try to take over. Um, Again, Saint Dominique or Hispaniola or whatever you, whatever you want to call the the total island, not just Haiti, but Haiti and Dominican Republic together. Um, they they actually had four regiments, um, four four uh, regiments. I think the I think they were Irish regiments. Um, that when they found out they were going to be fighting uh, there, they they almost mutinied. They they almost mutinied. They almost rebelled simply because serving in that part of the world for you know people used to it. You know the diseases associated with northern Europe, northern northwestern Europe. Uh, it was it was considered something of a death sentence. Like the the chances of you dying of disease were so high that it, soldiers were really um, reticent about actually actually deploying to that part of the world. But uh, essentially, um, they they gain independence. And we're going to flash forward here a little bit because, again, the, the whole idea is not to – I don't want to minimize Haitian history, but at the same token, we're, we're not going to go to all the ins and outs because it, it's just – I mean – my gosh. But um, to give you an idea, so so Haiti establishes independence and then from 1804 to 1806, or from, yeah, from 1804 to 1806, you have the first empire of Haiti uh, with Jacques the first as uh, essentially the, you know, I guess emperor. Um, then you have divided Haiti. Then you have the kingdom of Haiti. Then you have the Republic of Haiti from 1806 to 1820. Then you have the Republic of Haiti from 1820 to 1849. Then you have the second empire of Haiti. <laughs> um, then you have the Republic of Haiti again from 1859 to 1957. And and the important thing to look at here is that it, when you look through the list of all the leaders of, of Haiti, here's what you end up seeing. I'm just going to kind of read this off so you get an idea. Um, we'll, we'll start in... Um, uh, we'll start in 1902 here. So Florpil Hippolyte, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wrong name. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, Pierre Theoma Bozeron Canal, in power for 205 days, Liberal Party. Next leader, in power for five years, military. 
Next one was the Commission for Public Order. So there wasn't even a, a, a direct leader. Th they were in power for four days. <laughs> the next year's Francois Simone, uh, two years, 239 days, Liberal Party, then 359 days, National Party, 267 days, National Party, 260 days, Independent, 12 days, Military. Two, I mean, it's just back and forth with, with different military leaders taking control of the country. And, and this is very early on within, um, you know, Haiti's, Haiti's uh, history. It, it gets so bad. And, and part of this, and this is the part where you need to understand when a lot of people are analyzing Haiti and they look at Haiti's problems, they, they not only blame the colonization that took place under the French and under the Spanish uh, for the other parts, portions of the island, they also blame basically this indemnity that, that Haiti was forced to pay. So after Haiti wins its independence, the French essentially come back and threaten them that, hey, if you don't, if you don't pay us for essentially taking our colony, um, you know, we're going to blow up your port, right? And, and Haiti doesn't have the sort of military strength to be able to, yes, it could probably withstand an invasion at some point, uh, but it would be very, very costly. But when it, when it comes to competing with the French and naval power, that's just not happening. Um, and this is still at a this is still at a stage where the United States doesn't have the sort of naval power to really in, engage. You know, you have the Monroe Doctrine that that comes along later, which really discourages European countries from getting involved in the Western Hemisphere. But at this stage, that France still has the ability to essentially do enough damage to the Haitians where they decide to agree to the indemnity, and so they have to uh, essentially pay uh, the French for the loss of this French colony. And again, you can look at this going, look, it was a slave revolt. Like I, I, I think most people listening to this thinking they're far more sympathetic to the the Haitian situation in this particular case. So, can um, we talk a little bit more about the whole in indemnity? Yeah, controversy? sure. Go ahead. So. It, it was about a generation after they got their independence mm -hmm. and the political chaos mostly was 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 dealt with. Haiti's government was still unstable, but at least there wasn't hundreds of thousands of people dying on the island in a yeah. war. Right. And after the French Revolution, after the Napoleonic Wars, the restored Bourbon monarchy under I think it was Charles X of France comes back with a fleet of warships. Right. And this is in 1825. So almost 200 years ago. And basically what they said was, is that we will recognize you because France had never recognized Haiti. Yeah. Um, we will recognize you and we'll open up trade with you. Um, but you need to pay us for all of the lost property from the revolution. And they included the slaves themselves within that calculation of the property. And um, it was uh, not so subtle. Hey, please pay us money because like they sent a fleet of warships yeah. <laughs> with a whole bunch of cannons and an army yeah. and the Haitians were kind of like oh, this again. Yeah. So the, the Haitian government kind of agreed to pay the French and I've actually got the Wikipedia article pulled up. And the reason I'm going to show the Wikipedia article, because there's so many people that are like, Oh, Wikipedia is not a reliable source. That's kind of the point. Wikipedia has a left-wing bias, pretty clear left-wing bias. And so I'm kind of doing this on purpose because I want to show the perspective of so many left-wing activists that quite frankly think that the reason Haiti's a failed state today is because of ma colonialism or yeah. ma, you know, French war indemnity. And so this article goes on to say that the, um, the payment was originally the, um, equivalent of, um, uh, a hundred in it, it was it was 150 million francs, and yeah. then it was lowered to 90 million in 1838. Um, so basically, when you look at like inflation and stuff like that, that's the equivalent of about 33 billion today, which doesn't actually sound like a lot of money. But considered that the Haitian economy had been destroyed, they had lost yeah. 30 or 40 percent of their population. So that was actually a significant amount of money back then. Also money doesn't necessarily scale in a literal inflation sense like today to build a bridge yeah. versus a hundred years ago. Right. And you say, Oh, adjusted for inflation, they should be able to build a bridge for a hundred million today. Yeah. yeah. Good, good luck with that. <laughs> um, especially if the government's doing it. Right. Yeah. So long story short, Haiti was kind of bankrupted by this. And this article brings up, and this is correct. This article brings up how um, the United States actually kind of took on the debt for Haiti to pay the French. And so then the Haitians, in many respects, were paying the Americans because we well, were Citibank, right? Like yes. Citibank, because you had the you had the central bank of you had a central bank in France that also then ended up they, they took on the debt, right? So now the, there's a bank in France getting essentially paid the debt, and then they set up kind of a central bank in Haiti. So they're they're controlling a significant amount of the banking system within Haiti at this point, and then Citibank 
you know, or what is today's Citibank essentially buys the debt from the French. Yeah, it's like the equivalent of buying yeah. treasury bonds, yeah, right? Yeah. And so so the debt is now transferred to American holders rather than French holders because the French get their last payment in 1888. Mm-hmm. But Haiti keeps paying, you know, because again, we footed the bill for them. Mm-hmm. So they kept paying for to Citibank basically, or what became Citibank. Um, all the way up until 1947. So it took 122 years for Haiti to actually pay all of this money off. Now, the article goes on to say that, you know, eventually the Parliament of France in 2016 actually repealed the ordinance, although no reparations have been offered by France. And then it goes on to say that these debts have been denounced by some historians and activists as responsible for Haiti's poverty today as a case of serious and odious debt. So, there's there's more context here in this article. You know, it talks about the background. It talks about the the rebellion. It talks about the independence of Haiti and how it was a threat to you know the rest of Europe or the rest of the the Western world because it was a successful slave yeah. revolt at a time when slavery was still present in the Americas, in Brazil, in the United States, in most of these Caribbean colonies mm-hmm. held by the French and Spanish and British. But I. And then it talks about the ordinance from Charles X, who sent this fleet of warships in 1825 to basically bully the Haitians into paying the French in exchange for recognition and, you know, letting go of, of, you know, past French claims from the rebellion. And then it talks about things like, you know, the border differences, the evolution between the Haitian part of the island and what became the Dominican part of the island. Remember, the Dominican Republic is Spanish. It was not a French colony. It was an entirely separate colony and became an entirely separate country, although the Haitians did conquer and subjugate the Dominicans for a while. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff here. But long story short, the basic narrative that you've probably been told about Haiti and this, this indemnity that they had to pay the French with this infamous fleet in 1825 is actually encapsulated in this New York Times article. And it's a very flashy, very pretty looking article. You can tell that they had some interns that put a lot of work into it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it goes on to say, you know, France made generations of Haitians pay for their freedom in cash. And then it goes on to say, how much has remained a mystery until now? The Times scoured century old documents to find the answer. And then it goes on to say that the root of Haiti's mystery is reparation to enslavers. And then the article goes on to talk about how basically this narrative is, is that, you know, Haiti would have been this, this, you know, successful, you know, modern country, except they bankrupted themselves to pay the French, to pay off the enslavers. And oh, by the way, the, the banks that the money was deposited in the hands of the French were um, also the same banks that funded the Eiffel Tower. So the New York Times is basically arguing that the Eiffel Tower was paid yeah. with the uh, blood money of Haitians to their former slave masters and you know it it basically goes on to say that you know so many things in france today are actually built off of the backs of all of this debt that the haitians took on and and it also enriched wall street as well because of everything that we just brought up about how yeah american banks help finance this this debt being paid and and then it goes on you know talk about how violence and tragedy and hunger and underdevelopment these bywords have clung to Haiti for more than a century kidnappings outbreaks earthquakes the president assassinated that recently happened a couple of years ago this time in his bedroom how is it possible many ask that Haiti shares an island with the Dominican Republic with this underground subway system healthcare coverage public schools teeming resorts and impressive stretches of economic growth Corruption is the usual explanation, but then it goes on to say that, you know, but another story is rarely acknowledged, which is the fact that they had to pay all this money. So yeah. you get the gist, right? Yeah. This is the this is the narrative. This is the narrative that NGOs and left-wing activists and, quite frankly, a lot of Marxist or neo-Marxist historians that are using things like historical materialism or, you know, Hegelian dialectics, this is the narrative that they argue for why there's cannibals roaming in the streets today in Haiti. Because a French fleet showed up 200 years ago and pillaged all the money and the Haitians have never recovered and the evil American bankers helped finance it. And so us and the French are the reasons why Haiti is a failed state. Well, and, and I, I would say that that's certainly one part of it. The other thing that they're going to point to is like the reign of Papa Doc and Baby Doc. So in, in the starting in 1957, Francois Duvelier, I always screw up French pronunciations, um, and then his son essentially ruled Haiti from 1957 to 1985 until there was a popular uprising that overthrew his son. And the question is, okay, well, why are the why is the United States guilty for that? And it's like, well, there was there was a lot of regimes at that particular time that the U.S. gave varying degrees of support to because they were anti-communist, and and a lot of this was about fighting the, the Soviet Union being the bigger threat. And on some of these cases, look, we can argue all day long on on what is 
you know, what, what was, what is the proper, um, moral obligation of a country that you, you have a large enemy. And so you're essentially trying to, you know, consolidate allies or at least pe- keep people out of their sphere. Um, and so who, who do you side with in order to do that? And, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that every move the United States made on that was correct. I think there was a lot of moves that we made that were very bad and, you know, you, whatever short-term benefits you might've gained from, you know, keeping certain countries out of the hands of the, the Soviets, um, might not, you know, might not be a good trade under, you know, hindsight being 2020, if you look at the overall cost benefit analysis. Um, but by the same token, I think it's interesting that, again, when you when you look at kind of left wing narrative on anything like this, if if the United States props up somebody that they don't like, usually under the guise of they were anti-communist, well, that's horrible and immoral. And how could we have ever, you know, justified something like that? But by the same token, if the Soviet Union was propping up a dictator <laughs> in, in order to support, you know, the Marxists, well, that was just a, you know, that that's different. And and so this is where you start to see some of the analysis come through and you look at it and you're like, guys, it, it's, you're, you're kind of, you're not really hiding the ball anymore. It would be one thing if you were looking at both sides in this conflict and saying, yeah, both of them are engaging in these sort of, you know, foreign interference that we don't think is acceptable. The, the problem is, is that again, whenever, a, whenever a leftist government took power, no matter how violent it was, it was always the people, right? The people decided on Castro, the people decided. And then whenever the United States would, would prop up a government that was anti-communist. It was always thwarting the, the people's true desires and, and claims for a greater egalitarian state. And, and so that's one of the reasons why, whenever I look at this analysis, there's two things that I try to, there's two things that I try to guard against. One is, is that generally speaking, when a country speaks of its own history, it, it's usually a little bit more friendly to itself than, you know, third parties would be, or obviously your antagonist would be. And so I do think it's important to look at various perspectives on this. And, and I do think relevant points are brought up with respect to, okay, well, the United States actively engaged in propping up some people that weren't very good guys, or the United States, you know, a- actively engaged in, you know, th- this debt that we might look at and say, yeah, that was inappropriate. We can also look at the the French presence as well. Obviously, we, we find slavery to be morally reprehensible. What's also important to understand is that that at stage slavery was the norm, right? It, it, <laughs> abolition was, was not the norm. Slavery was, you know, practiced all across the globe. So, so the real question here that we're trying to get to is, okay, these are fair points. These are absolutely fair points that, that Haiti got strapped with some debt that, that it shouldn't have got strapped with. Uh, it's an absolute fair point to look back and at least say, yeah, these guys were not good leaders and, and perhaps the United States is, should have not have had anything to do with them. Even if, they were at that time struggling to just try to prevent the Soviet Union from being overly influential, any more influential than they already were in certain uprisings that took place, obviously, in Cuba, other places in Central America and South America. Right. So let's let's acknowledge all of it. Let's acknowledge all that. All that's bad. All of that would have had detrimental effects. Does it really explain, though, the current state of Haiti? And that's the part that I think is very problematic because there are any number of countries that you can point to all across the world that have gone through similar struggles, similar issues, um, some of them far worse, maybe some of them not as bad, that are not the hellscape that Haiti is right now. And you also can't claim that the United States has not done anything in order to try to bring peace and stability to Haiti, whether it be through massive amounts of foreign aid or a complete military deployment that last, I think, over six months in the mid-90s where the 82nd Airborne and, and numerous other troops were down there to, again, create some degree of stability for the successful distribution of foreign aid, right? And that cost the United States hundreds of millions of dollars in order to launch that operation. And it's not as if we had some sort of legal obligation to do that. And, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is because I, I was watching a show uh, a while back from from a page I really like, War Graphics, Simon Whistler. I, I, I actually think they do some really good work. But it was it was amazing listening to this whole idea of like we've predicted this for you know months now and we've talked about it we've done four different episodes and nobody did anything and now look and I'm thinking to myself what do you mean nobody did anything I get, more and more I, I I get frustrated with this narrative that seems to be something bad is going on in the world the United States needs to do something and then when the United States does something they're like oh well you know why it's so bad is because the United States did something. Like the left wing narrative is damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Heads you lose, tails they win. No matter what action the United States takes, we're always to blame. 
if we if we get involved, we're to blame for the way we got involved. If we don't get involved, we're to blame because we we should have done something. And the problem that I think a lot of Americans are having with a situation like Haiti, as well as a number of other things, is this idea of like, what exactly are, are we responsible for? And, and can, can we get some idea of whether or not this actually falls within our obligation as a country? And that's what I want to talk to next is, is, is essentially what is our obligation? Because as you're looking at what's going on in Haiti right now with gang leaders running the country, with like actual acts of cannibalism, one of the most important questions that you've got to ask right now is where does your meat come from? Because I'll tell you right now, good ranchers and sures, all right, that when you are biting into that steak, you know that it is raised here right in the United States of America by all of the ranchers that have teamed up with good ranchers to make sure that you are being provided quality American raised beef, pork, poultry, and they've even got wild caught seafood. In fact, if you go on goodranchers.com right now, you use promo code Nick and you sign up for one of the subscriptions, you're going to get two pounds of wings with each order for an entire year. Right. And this is important because once again, when you go into the grocery store and you see a little American flag on, on whatever the, the meat you're about to buy, you're thinking, OK, this was this was raised here in the United States. Right. It's gone through the proper whatever to ensure that this is safe. That's not the case. Right. You can have you can have something from a feedlot in a foreign country coming into the United States. And as long as it goes through a minor amount of processing, all of a sudden they stick the American flag on it and you think you're buying something that you're not buying. But that's not the case with good ranchers. Right. You are going to get good quality raised meat here in the United States shipped directly to your door. So go to goodranchers.com, use promo code Nick, sign up for one of those subscriptions. Like I said, you get a free wings with each order for a year. That's a two pound order of wings. All right. Think of all, think of all the sporting events that are coming up. Good Ranchers got you covered. So go and check that out. All right. So let's get back. Uh, let's get back to this. Can, can we dismantle this, uh, an indemnity argument because there's a few examples that you can point to. Sure, that- go ahead. Well, so so let's do that. Like right now, so right now to give everyone an idea, and people have seen things on the news, but essentially the president of Haiti was assassinated. Um, what would have been their equivalent of the prime minister kind of stepped into that position. Um, security was a huge issue with these gangs. The the G9 gang is probably the biggest one. That's the one run by this guy named Barbecue, right? That's his nickname. I think it's Jimmy Shiv- Sh- I was butcher his last name. Sherizer, Sherizer, Jimmy Sher, yeah, Barbecue. So, um gangs have pretty much taken over. He fled to go to Kenya because they were setting up a security agreement where there was going to be, you know, troops from Kenya, from the UN that were going to come over and provide a certain degree of, of security to be able to push back because the Haitian police were not able to handle all, all the gang violence. Um, as he's flying back, the gangs get so bad where they take over one of the prisons, they release everybody, and the plane gets diverted to Puerto Rico. And the person serving, the unelected leader of Haiti at this point, um, steps down, and now we're kind of dealing with a just chaos in, in Haiti at this point. So that's the that's the current status on the ground right now in Haiti where gangs are pretty much, you know, I shouldn't say running the country because that's not even what they're doing. Nobody's running the country. You just have certain gangs that are more powerful than others that are essentially have all the authority at, at this point. And the, the government is essentially non-existent. Yeah. Essentially non-existent, F- fairly helpless and in, in being able to stop it when this guy can just pretty much walk the streets and, you know, tweet about it. But so in other words, it's a libertarian's paradise. Well, according right? to the, according to the left's version of what a libertarian's paradise would be, but no, it's a, uh, it's a, it's just anarchy. Um, so, but again, so the arguments, the arguments for why Haiti is in this current situation is, you know, the indemnity has made Haiti poor over decades. And so they were never able to build useful infrastructure. The United States uh, involved itself in such a ways that were inappropriate and propped up leaders that it shouldn't have had, you know, this contributed to the overall corruption. And so essentially Haiti's plight is ultimately the fault of the West in general, but specifically France and the United States. So let's, let's tackle the indemnity argument. Yeah, let's tackle the indemnity argument first. And you know, the, the easiest things that you can point to you can point to Singapore and Eastern Germany. And I stress Eastern Germany for a reason. Here's what I mean. Singapore was also colonized. Singapore was an island that had no natural resources. It didn't have uh, 60% of the world's coffee or 40% of the world's sugar. And it was incredibly poor 
it was a port. It was an important port for the British Empire, but it was still incredibly poor when it got its independence in the 1960s from the United Kingdom. Singapore is now richer than its former colonizer. Yeah, per capita. Yeah. Fully developed first world country, standard of living on par with the United States. Yeah. Income as on par with the United States. It's it's one of the richest countries in the world. And it has no natural resources. And it was a former colony. A tiny former colony as well. And so this idea that, oh, well, colonization is the reason that that, you know, Haiti is is poor. Then why is Singapore so rich? And and if you say, well, that's not a fair comparison, okay, look at their neighbor right next door. Why is the Dominican Republic? It's not, it's not ultra rich but the dominican republic is far richer oh it's got like five times the gdp per capita so we're, we're not even yeah five times the gdp per capita and last i checked they're not engaging in cannibals in the streets and having driven their government leaders into exile and the mm-hmm. state itself has collapsed into absolute anarchy in the dominican republic and that's literally next door yeah. and so then the the argument is oh well it's because the dominican republic didn't have to pay you know the equivalent of you know all these billions of dollars in indemnities okay you know who did have to pay a whole bunch of war indemnities germany did <laughs> There was yeah. this thing called World War One. There was this all. There was another thing called the Treaty of Versailles. You might have heard of it, right? Um, Germany had to pay so much money that they engaged in hyperinflation a hundred years ago in the 1920s in order to help pay off the war debt and the reparations that the Allies had imposed on Germany at the end of World War One, and that completely destroyed the German economy. There was again hyperinflation where they were walking around with wheelbarrows full of money in order to buy loaves of bread. Is Germany a complete failed state today? Do they are they engaging in cannibal cannibalism in the streets? Here's a question: Have they deforested the entire country? Have they ripped the railroads out of the ground in the country? This is something that a lot of these left wing academics have left have left out of the picture. Did you know that Haiti used to have a rail network? Used to have a rail network. They they built railroads in the country in the 1880s and 90s and in the early 1900s. There's no railroads in in Haiti left. They literally ripped the railroads out to melt down the, the metals that the rail lines and the trains were made out of. Who forced them to do that? Like, like was it the, were, were it the evil French colonizers or the ghosts of the enslavers from 100 years before, the ones who literally dismantled their own infrastructure network? Why did they do that? Why did they deforest the country? There's people well, they, that- they claim they deforested the country in order to pay the indemnity. Mm-hmm. My, my question, though, is that, OK, again, and I understand that the commodity prices change over time and things like that. But if, if a significant portion of your colony's wealth in the first place was found in coffee and sugar, why wouldn't you continue to engage in that sort of agricultural practices in order to pay back the indemnity as opposed to deforestation? The other thing, too, is, is that remember when I said that the indemnity was paid off in the 1940s yeah. or, or the, the loans that they had taken from us to pay the French were paid off in the 1940s. Um, in 1950, 50 percent of Haiti was still forested. Today, it's like less than five yeah. percent. So post paying off the debt. So that doesn't make any sense. The, but, but go back to the Germany explanation. Right. Germany was utterly destroyed in two world wars, destroyed itself through hyperinflation in the 1920s, had this uh, guy from this former colonel in the German military from Austria, failed painter, you might have heard of him. Fa- fa- former corporal. So, not sorry, corporal, yeah, corporal, corporal. Not, not, not a colonel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, former, that was that was Stauffenberg who was the corporal. Yeah. <laughs> it was the colonel. But um, uh, yeah, there was this uh, failed painter that took over, a complete madman that plunged the country into another state of absolute war and destruction and completely ruined the country in the 1940s and then they were occupied by the west and the soviets split in two for 40 years and one half had a marxist leninist regime imposed on it so like when i bring up germany everybody's like oh but the marshall plan is the reason that germany recovered east germany didn't get a cent from the marshall plan you know what east germany got east germany got marxist leninism for 40 (laughs) years and they got the soviets coming in and dismantling the infrastructure and the industry and hauling it back to the soviet union after they had slaughtered Millions of Germans fighting on the Eastern Front. So the Soviets didn't do the East Germans any favors. Look at where the Eastern part of Germany is today. In fact, look at where East Germany was before the reunification of Germany. They're still richer than the Haitians. And that was a country, again, that was blown to hell, had millions, billions 
in war debt from two wars and reparations, was occupied, split in two, and had a Marxist regime imposed on it for two generations, and they're still richer off than the Haitians. So this idea that the the indemnity, the evil French, or the reasons that Haiti is a failed state today is, quite frankly, left-wing cope. I, I think what's interesting about this, um, from the perspective of... So, so let's look at... Again, if we, if we want to explain some of the problems that Haiti is going through right now to the extent that the West is um, responsible, what I think is interesting is I don't think it's because of the indemnity. I don't think it's because of Papa Doc necessarily, although that, that's more recent. I'll, I'll accept that, that you know, that's problematic. I, I actually think the foreign aid has a significant amount to explain with some of the problems here. And, and this is Haiti is not the only place that we see this. When you get a country that is in a dire situation and people want to understandably help, it is one thing to offer assistance to get through a natural disaster or to get through a war or whatever it is. It's one thing to offer assistance there. It is another thing to essentially make a country completely dependent upon foreign aid for its economic well-being. If you do that, then what you've essentially done is you've said, we don't believe this country is fully capable of being able to run its own affairs. And so now it's going to be dependent upon foreign aid. Well, again, a lot comes with foreign aid. I, I, we were talking about this before, whether it was Ron Paul or somebody else that said that foreign aid has essentially become a transfer of wealth from poor people in rich countries to rich people in poor countries. Because who gets the aid when it's usually distributed, especially by governments that inevitably end up being corrupt? Well, the governments decide who gets the aid. And, and lo and behold, there's some overhead associated with the distribution of those goods and services. And, and even when you deploy forces in order to try to make sure that it's delivered where it ought to be, the end state then becomes is that people no longer look to themselves. They no longer look to their own civic organizations or, or their, even their own government. They look to the foreign entity to be able to provide them with the goods and services, which also creates a problem for anybody that might actually want to start a business providing the goods and services. And, and I, I dealt with this in Iraq. I'll, I'll never forget in 2006, sitting down with a Iraqi colonel. And I told him, I've told the story before. I said, look, we have gone to every village we go to. People always ask about energy. They always need like generators, generators. Gen that's the number one request we get. I said, why hasn't some enterprising Iraqi decided to sell generators, right? Or, or provide some sort of generator service. And he goes, well, we have, we have embargoes on the sort of stuff that we can actually bring into the country. So, okay, well, that's problematic, but that's also a problem of your government not allowing you to do this. I said, okay, fine. Well, why don't you get smaller size generators and, and you utilize them that way? And he goes, well, you know, if, if somebody is providing power for me or they can't pay, and we're a very tribal society. And if it's my family member or my cousin, I'm not going to shut off his power because he can't pay. I'm like, okay, great. Don't sell to your family. Sell somewhere else in the country, right? Do, do it that way. That way there's a little bit of distance. And he finally looks at me and he goes, why would I do that when you'll give it to us for free? I was like, there we go. Now we've got to the crux of this problem. This is now learned dependency. And, and a lot of times people will look on from the outside and say, well, they're just being lazy. No, they're actually making an economically wise decision because if they actually invest the time and the effort to build the capital, to provide the goods and services which are required, and then a large foreign entity comes in and just dumps it all on the economy for free, you lost all the capital that you invested in order to provide those goods and services. And so there is something to be said for how do you actually assist in a way that makes sense? And again, if you got a natural disaster, if you're trying to help somebody recover after war, you can make some arguments for how foreign aid can assist with that process. But if it's not actually developed in such a way to provide independence or survival post you giving stuff away for free, then you're going to run into some major problems with, with the sort of trends that you create with the sort of dependency that you create. And so what I find interesting is when the left gets furious with the United States because we haven't done enough or why haven't we done more? We're a rich country. We can do X, Y, and Z. I look back on the stuff that we have tried to do supposedly in line with their objectives. And it's like, that's also created problems. So are, are we going to start having an honest conversation about what would actually work? Because Here's a fascinating part about the Marshall Plan that never gets discussed. The countries that actually took less money from the Marshall Plan actually ended up doing better in Europe. In fact, 
West Germany was so tired of the price controls that the United States was imposing on Germany, on West Germany, under the Marshall Plan, right? Because there was still military occupation taking place, that they waited for a weekend when they knew that the generals would be gone, that everybody else would get, and they removed all the price controls in Germany. And essentially, the, the U.S. forces really didn't know how to respond to it, so they didn't do anything. But the United States was actually hampering West Germany's economy and some of the other economies by trying to engage in the sort of New Deal policies, the sort of like, you know, FDR approach toward micromanagement of the economy. And all they wanted was to make the market as free as possible. And so, again, they did it on the weekend in order to do that. So we're actually going to have another guest talking about what's going on in some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa talking about the same thing on how like, no, more foreign aid is not what is needed right now. What's needed it is actually a robust um, a robust environment where people have property rights that they can be sure of, they can have security. They know they're not going to be fleeced by their own government through massive amounts of corruption. And so this leads into what we're really going to talk about today is, okay, we recognize this is a, a pain. The left thinks this explains it. The right thinks something else explains it. I, I would say we're willing to accept that there was a lot of bad things that were done that adversely impacted Haiti, but we're not willing to accept that that explains everything that there's no possible way that any of this could have been overcome. And we're also not willing to accept this idea that really what's needed is for more Western nations or even wealthier nations to just throw money at Haiti, right? Because we've done this before. So we, we've had foreign invasion in order to restore democracy, right? You, you, had, you had problems in Haiti in the mid nineties, the United States comes in and the whole purpose was, is we're going to restore democracy. We're going to provide stability and security. We're going to provide this breathing space for the Haitian government to, to collect itself, get back in charge. We're going to pour massive amount, massive amounts of, of foreign aid in there. And then we're going to, we're going to give them a kickstart and then they'll take it from there. And guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work. You could argue that it worked for a relatively short period of time, but the underlying fundamentals were not there. So you can have an internal dictator, right? Is that what you need? Like, for instance, in El Salvador, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to suggest that this guy is a dictator because he's not. He was popularly elected. In fact, he's got like a 92% popularity. But he went in there and gangs were such a problem in El Salvador, such a major problem in El Salvador, that they essentially passed special legislation to extend new powers of the government to be able to deal with the gang crisis. And then they, I think it originally it was like for 30 days and they've extended it like several, several months now. But the government actually utilized its police and military forces to crack down on the gangs and, and just break the back of MS-13 in El Salvador. Unfortunately, the internal dictators in, in Haiti have just used it as an opportunity to enrich themselves and the people closest to them at the expense of everybody. And they've done the same thing with foreign aid. There's also been colonization of Haiti. So you've had some, you've had a foreign government come in and completely run the place. Right now, obviously, it was back in the 17 and 1800s and, and even you know, prior to that. And so it was a pretty brutal form uh, of colonization. So the question is, is that there's been a lot of various attempts to try to secure Haiti. None of it's worked. What is going to work? Like what, what would work? And, and at this point, I'm, kinda, I'm convinced of a couple of things. Just dropping more foreign aid is uh, all it's going to do is create the same sort of learned dependency it has before uh, a significant amount of the foreign aid will actually fall into the hands of these gangs and everything else. If you send in the U.S. military in order to make sure that it gets to the people, all that does is transfer the authority from gangs to essentially the United States military. And then we're going to get chastised for, you know, essentially running the country for Haiti when we need to have Haitians running it. Fair enough. So, OK, so what do you need? Be Obviously, just more money, Nick. <laughs> well, more money to NGOs. And <laughs> well, and, and it's not like Haiti hasn't elected left-wing politicians who believed in egalitarianism, right? Have they tried socialism? Yet? Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, so we had like me and my me and my SF buddies at one point. We we did. We thought it would be kind of a fun project to sit down and analyze Haiti, and this we did this like several years ago, and because we were asking the question, it's like okay. You know, we 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 work in counterinsurgency and unconventional warfare. This is this is what we do. So we're gonna take a we're gonna take a use case. We're gonna take a a not quite a failed state, but let's say a, a country on the verge of being a failed state, and now it is one. Okay, how would a bunch of green berets attempt to solve this problem? Like, is there a way to to make Haiti not only secure but actually prosperous? And and a, 
a main part of the conclusion that that we talked about. And again, we are we are talking about this from a from a, a moral framework. We're not saying, well, you got to go in and just you know run the place as a bring a, the French back, yeah, <laughs> heavy handed dictatorship, yeah. right? Like that was not our answer. Our answer was is like, is there a way to do this? And and part of the conclusion that we came to from fighting an insurgency in Iraq was that this sort of stuff generally takes a, a couple of things. One, you almost need a generation. You, you, need a, you need a generation of kids that have grown up in an environment where they've had some space to not be terrified of either starving to death or being shot, right? So, so you, need, you need a generation of, of kids that can grow up in an environment where, you know, theoretically they've been able to not only receive an education, right? That's like, oh, I just need to send them more to school. They, no, they can't just receive an education. They actually have to see a pathway to economic uh, mobility and security within their environment. And so that doesn't come from the government taking this heavy handed approach where it's attempting to micromanage the economy. It comes from the government kind of narrowly focusing its efforts on just the security aspect. So how, how do we create an environment where to the extent that you're going to have private organizations that want to come in and, and assist with, say, education? Like right now, the Catholic Church does a lot of work in, in Haiti trying to provide education. So, OK, so we're not going to have the government attempting to run the whole school system. We want the government to, again, be very, very singularly focused on law and order. You are going to be safe. Now, why is that so important? Because if people are fairly certain that they're going to be safe, both physically and with respect to their property and their transactions, you'll be amazed at how they start to analyze their own situation very differently and shift from living day to day to actually planning things out in the future in order to improve their own economic well-being, their own economic and social well-being. And so that was going to be the first focus was you had to go in, you had to break the back of the gangs. You had to break the back of the, the corrupt elements and whatnot. And you had to have a government that people felt fairly confident in. Now, here was the other thing that we really struggled with. How did you do that with democratic processes within the current state of Haiti? Because people are saying, when, when again, when you are living day to day, from a subsistence level, but also from a, a, a threat of security level, how are you actually holding fair and open and honest elections? Well, they're currently not. And and can you do it? Can you do it um, regularly? Like, can you do it regularly for the legislature? Can you do it regularly for that? Or do you have to have, do you have to have a strong man that is really good at providing the security but still respects property rights and isn't so corrupt that they're like stealing from, you know, the people that they're essentially so, raiding the national bank or like whatever. The current government of Haiti, which doesn't actually even really exist, yeah. <laughs> um, hasn't held elections in several years. Yeah. Not because they don't necessarily want to, although I'm sure there's some people that think that they don't, but it's it's more that like they physically can't do it. Like I, I there's can't no way to effectively manage there's, there's it. There's no way to do it. There's again, there is no government. There's yeah. no, there's no functioning police force. There's well, no and, military. And even when they had there's no one court system, there's yeah. Even when they had one, it's like, okay, you've got a Haitian government. You got a Haitian police force. The problem is, is that there's not a great deal of trust in it. And the, the various gangs that you have and the gangs are all over the place with respect to how many, like the, the number of gangs that people um, analyze are, are currently operating. Haiti. But G nine is one of the big ones. How do you run a fair and free and open election, a transparent election, when the gangs that control their various territories, even if they're not walking in and stuffing ballot boxes, everybody knows, everybody knows the way you better, you know, be voting. And again, the, I, I the think government it, cannot exercise control. I mean, at this point, they can't exercise control over any any part of the entire country. Yeah. But but even when there was a government like post earthquake that happened in 2010, because that a lot of people also bring that up too that that there was that. And then I mean, there it's it's just been one blow after the, the other. Right. Like yeah. there was there was like a cholera outbreak. The economy called well, the economy was already garbage, but the economy collapsed in like 2018. You know, inflation went through the roof like the gang war blew up and then there was COVID and all everything that happened with that. And just one thing led to another. And then the president was assassinated. Right. 
and and then they they couldn't hold elections because gang wars blew up and and eventually it just got to a point where it's only just now people are waking up and realizing, oh, it's a total failed state when in reality you could argue, well, it's been a failed state for a very, very, very long time. And before that, it was a kleptocratic, dysfunctional dictatorship that was just enriching its buddies. Well, so so here's the here's the question. Like if we can acknowledge that trying to trying to hold free and honest elections is almost an impossibility at this point. Well, then that leaves you with the question like, okay, then how are you supposed to provide for security? And this is why you've had various times where usually you have a general that steps in, right? Or you have some sort of military figure. Haiti doesn't have that. Well, in Haiti's history too, they had like three separate times where they decided to try monarchy. Yeah. Right. And, and then invade the Dominican Republic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't bring the third empire back. Yeah. Be, but I, here's what they do. And you hinted at it. They, they take. Two things, two countries that I think that they should lean heavily from, and one is culturally more, it's it's not exactly the same, but it's more similar than the other one. One is Singapore, yeah, and the other one is El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring this up is because people might be like, Christian, you're out of your mind. How could they be like, like Singapore? Entirely different cultures, entirely different histories, literally on the other side of the world, right? I, I get that, but look at the way that the government and the judicial system and the economy, for that matter, function in a country like Singapore. Singapore is derided by some people as being authoritarian, but it is a, a free market country with strong property rights yeah. and a very strong judicial system. Yeah. There's no crime in Singapore. They <laughs> don't even spit gum out on the streets in Singapore. Yeah. You get caned for that. <laughs> and you know what? It works. Yeah. It works in Singapore. There's no crime and you have the rule of law and you have property rights and people are free to engage in the free market. And you, and they do. Singapore is an economic powerhouse. And, you know, and, and here's another example that's more similar to Haiti because I might be proposing a, you know, pie in the sky type scenario that imagine if Haiti became yeah. Singapore, right? A lot of people are laughing, but the way you get that is through that judicial system. Well, look at what happened in El Salvador. El Salvador had the highest murder rate in, in the entire Western hemisphere, certainly in North America. Mm -hmm. Some of these countries in South, South America might, might give it a run for its money, like Venezuela or Bolivia, yeah. failed socialist communist states, right? But El Salvador had terrible gang violence, horrific gang violence, one of the highest murder rates in the world, yeah. let alone in North America. It was effectively a failed state, and it had a history of corrupt dictatorships that that didn't have the rule of law, didn't have property rights. Instead, again, just kleptocratic regimes, incompetent regimes, failed governments, civil wars, it, you know, no stable anything, right? Yeah. It was effectively a failed state for a long time. And then Bukele came in and look at what he did. Yeah. And you know what? People in the in, in the West, again, all these NGOs and liberal activists yeah. and civil rights groups and everybody are like, oh, look, he's acting like a tyrant. They had a free election and he got 90% of the vote. And yeah. the overwhelming majority of the El Salvadorian Americans voted for him. You know, when you and I went to this gun show in Northern Virginia last September, I met somebody that was a listener of the podcast. His name was Jose. And he came up to me. And knowing me, who's a total shudder, and I was like, what? This this random stranger wants to come up to me, and he's like, are you Christian? I'm like, the, the religion or the name? Because yeah. it's yes to both. But, you know, he, he was like, I love your show, man. You know, everything yeah. that you and Nick do. I totally agree. He was a hu huge fan of, like, the Austrian school. He His family was from El Salvador. Mm. Um He's an American, but his whole family's from El Salvador, and he still has family in El Salvador. And we struck up, like, a 15-minute conversation about what was going on in El Salvador. Yeah. And he was like... No, like we've got everything under control except for one thing that needs to be fixed now, which is the education system. Because mm -hmm. I was like, El Salvador is is in position to boom now. And he's like, yes, but we need the education. That's the one thing we still need to tackle. But he did bring up that like the crime is gone. The yeah. gang wars are gone. There's not blood flowing through the streets because guess what? The president locked up the criminals. Who knew that? If you brutalize criminals rather than you treat them like victims. Yeah. And, in, and instead, you put more sympathy to the criminals than you do the actual victims, which is, guess what? What left-wing politicians do in places like San Francisco, New York, Chicago, L.A., every place that the left controls in the United States, and quite frankly, in Europe as well, look at London, yeah. there's more sympathy given to the people that are engaging in stabbings than the ones that are actually getting stabbed. Oh, I, I was, I, I can't say, I wanted, to, I wanted to learn more about what was going on in El Salvador, and just about everything I watched... Uh, on YouTube was yes, but 
And it was it was always okay. Yeah, we get it. MS-13 was essentially running the country and murdering people at will, and there was like horrible, inept corruption. And then these guys came in and, and kind of fixed it. But they they arrested a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, they sure did because there was a lot of people doing bad things. Like this is one of the things that I hear in the and, and I hear this sometimes from my libertarian friends because I'm very sympathetic to libertarian philosophy on, on a number of things. But one of the things I hear all the time, like, oh, it's the highest incarceration rate. Like, I, I get that we don't want a higher incarceration rate. A higher incarceration rate is not a, a desired end state. But you want to know what it's more preferable than? A lower incarceration rate where bad guys are out there raping, murdering, killing, stealing, you know, and assaulting people. I would rather, like, I would rather they don't, they don't do those things. I, I would rather, I'm, I'm happy to work with people on creating conditions where we think that is less likely. Okay, but what I'm not willing to do is say, well, you know what? In order to get that incarceration rate down, let's just go ahead and let these violent people out of jail real quick. By the way, we're going to take away your guns because they're dangerous. Like that's the sort of insanity that we're dealing with right now. They're in El doing Salvador. it in Virginia. I know. Well, in, in, in El Salvador, this is the, again, I, I get it. Like I'm always skeptical of, of government power when they're, when they're, you know, uh, suspending rights or they're limiting mobility. Like I get it. I get it. But one of the things people need to wake up and realize, and, and this is something that John Adams said that I think is so important. When John Adams said, our constitution is written for a moral and religious people and is totally unsuited to any other. What we was essentially saying, what he was reiterating was this idea that freedom and representative government and all of these other things, these are byproducts of a civilization, of a society that is capable of self-regulation, self-regulation. And cooperation. They're byproducts. You don't just go in there and have an election and now, oh, I guess everything's fine now. That, we that's voted. not it. <laughs> yeah, we voted. We should be good, right? That's and, and it's incredible to me because it is such a, I think, a historically ignorant way to view the world. This is not this is not how people have always interacted. This is not it's not that every other civilization before us and every other system of government was just evil and mean and greedy and bad. And now we, and thank God we came around and we're the good ones. No, there there was a there was an entire civilization or there was an entire uh, philosophical foundation that has to be laid in order to make that possible. Right? And and that's the part where uh, again the, the reason why I find libertarian philosophy so appealing is because I honestly do believe when they talk about the non-aggression principle and when you talk about these things, yes, that's what I want. I want to get as close to that as possible. But I also understand what people will do. Like I've, I've seen enough of the world. I've been in some pretty dangerous situations. I understand what people do when they do not feel secure. And I don't want to get to a state where people feel so insecure about their own security, financial, physical, or otherwise, that they are begging for somebody, anybody, to come in and stop the bad guys. Like, I don't care what you got to do, stop the barbarians on the other side of the gate. That's what I. That's all I want. That's, and, how, that's how you get object tyranny, because when people yeah. have to choose between, you know, the, the phrase that, you know, well, you know, if you, you know, prioritize security over liberty, you'll get neither. Well, a lot of people, if they're having to pick between them, and you might say it's a bad choice, but the fact is, is that we know from history that people do this all the time. If you have to pick, pick between liberty and security, most people will pick security. Mm -hmm. And and people who have a libertarian inclination might say this is a travesty, but you're not going to change the fact that that's how people are going to operate. So what you have to do if you want to avoid tyranny, because I, I don't want tyranny either. Yeah. Nobody nobody wants tyranny unless you're the tyrant, Yeah. right? And so the way that you avoid tyranny is not simply say, well, just vote harder. Yeah. Because as you said, it's a by democracy is a byproduct of a system that actually works. That's when you can actually have things like representative government and free elections. But if there's no rule of law and there's no property rights and it's just, it, it's it's pure state of nature, right? War of all against all. And mm -hmm. that's, that's very close to where Haiti is at this point. It's yeah. just pure state of nature, right? Absolute anarchy in the truest sense. You know, eat your heart out, Rousseau. Like <laughs> that—that's that, yeah. where Haiti is. There's only one solution, which is you have to restore order and rule of law, and you need to maintain property rights because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that can lift people out of poverty is property rights and free markets. But you can't have property rights and free markets if people are engaging in cannibalism in the streets and you have gangs shooting each other up for turf wars. There's there's no way that you could actually build economic growth in an environment like that. So like I, I, 
the, the two, again, the two places I'm going to go back to, the two places that I would say that Haiti needs to learn from is Singapore and El Salvador. Yeah. Well, and, I, I think, can I say another thing here that I think is important? Because w- one of the things that Singapore and El Salvador both recognized was that they needed and wanted foreign investment. And foreign investment doesn't come into a situation. Foreign investment does not come if there isn't a certain degree of, again, control and security within the streets, right? So I'm not investing. I'm not building a hotel in your country if the bad guys are going to come and essentially kill me and take my stuff. I'm also not going to set up a hotel in your country if the government's going to come and kill me and take my stuff. Right. So that that's the balance. And this is the thing where, again, I, I think the left completely misunderstands this. Because when, when they have this idea of we're just going to show up and we're going to throw money at the problem. And when that doesn't work, well, it's because we haven't thrown enough money at it. Right. Or, or they don't have a strong enough. Like I, I understand the argument of there, there needs to be something to create order. The thing that I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in wondering if Haiti could be a use case for this is how do you get the private investment? And the conclusion that we came to when we were looking at this is first and foremost, stop all the killing in the streets. Do what you need to do in order to do that. And then you have to have enough control over that environment to where people who would could see the opportunity associated with Haiti will look at that and be like, okay, so if I invest down there, which is, is so the, the risk to reward, right? The risk to reward in Haiti right now is you can probably buy Caribbean property cheaper in Haiti than anywhere else in the world, baby, right? Like if you are looking for, I want a house overlooking the ocean Haiti is probably one of the cheapest places to do it right now, but that's because gangs will kill you. So nobody's going to do it. And when the gangs don't kill you, the government, you know, is corrupt as hell. So they're not going to do it. So if you can create the, the sort of environment where it's like, we've got it locked down. And honestly, it wouldn't take, it wouldn't take a huge force to lock it down. It, it really wouldn't. Um, you would, you would have to, you would have to work by through and with, right? It's not like some outside force. I mean, yeah, if you want to deploy the 82nd airborne division down there, you, you can wipe out the gangs pretty quick. So, but as soon as they leave, the security vacuum goes with it. I was going to say, because there's been, and, and we have the article from the, the AP here about all the different interventions that go back over a hundred years ago. Right. Yeah. And th- I think there's been three major interventions that have taken place and two of them within the last like 30 to 40 years. Mm-hmm. And so then the question is, you know, out of the solutions there, right, you know, from the most outlandish, you know, outlandish to, you know, the most realistic foreign intervention is what everybody's talking about right now. Yeah. Oh, does the United States need to send in troops or, you know, Haiti itself before its government collapsed was trying to work with with Kenya to bring yeah. over like the police officers from Kenya. And, and Bukele, the president of El Salvador, actually tweeted last month that like, well, we could solve the problem, but yeah. we need to be invited in and we need our our expenses to be covered. Yeah. You know, but we can do exactly what we did in El Salvador. And so the question is, like, if a foreign intervention took place today, a what would it fail like all the other ones before? Yeah. And if it doesn't, what would need to be different in order for it to not fail compared to previous ones? Because like the United States has been there repeatedly in the past. And quite frankly, I think a lot of Americans are like, who cares about Haiti? They destroyed their own country. Well, that's their problem. That's the first thing I want to say is that this, this whole idea that the United States has some sort of like the United States government, right? The, which is the entity that operates on behalf of the people of the United States has some sort of legal or moral obligation to solve Haiti, I think is ridiculous. I think it's absurd. We do not have a legal or moral obligation to do that. We've got plenty of problems within our own borders right now that we should be focusing on. That doesn't mean, now I can say all of that, believe it, vote appropriately. That doesn't mean that I want people to suffer in Haiti. The question is, is okay, what's the best way to go about it? What, what I think is a, a very interesting thought exercise at this point, and the problem is, is that the United Nations and other governments probably wouldn't allow it to take place is, what you would actually need is some sort of collaboration between friendly elements within Haiti and an outside element that is actually capable of bringing in enough force to provide security. And then you would build out from there, right? Like you'd secure a particular area and then you would build out from there. And the idea would be is once you have certain areas secured, certain benefits start to be realized, right? So the, the, the obvious benefit from establishing security is I can, I can walk my kids to school or I can walk to work or I can open up my little shop on the side of the road and I'm not going to get killed, right? The, the secondary benefits have to do with w- what, is the, what is the perceived benefit of foreign investors to be able to come down and do things. 
Well, again, Haiti's been trashed for a long time now, so it's not like you're getting resorts overnight or anything like that. But there are other areas where Haiti could be potentially successful from an agricultural standpoint. And eventually over time from a tourism standpoint, another option is a banking standpoint. And so th that's number one. Here's the problem. Here's what I don't understand. And I would love a solution to this because we couldn't come up with one. How do you get that? How do you agree? How do you establish some degree of stability? And then as soon as you have open elections, not have a horribly corrupt left-wing government that comes in and essentially decides to either fleece your foreign investors or confiscate property or, you know, whatever it is. How do you prevent that? Because history has shown that it just doesn't seem to work. And, and so the thought exercise side of this, and I don't say this as somebody that, you know, I don't approve of, you know, unelected governments essentially controlling things. But we, we essentially came to the conclusion that like, I don't know how, because I don't know how that would work, I would never invest in it. Now, if I could be guaranteed, if I could be guaranteed that you, you would have a government that at the very least, at the very least, focus primarily on a fair, just, and transparent judicial system, rigorously enforced property rights, and punished violent crime, theft, and things of that nature, right? Upheld contract law. If I had a government that it would, I knew could do that, for a good 30 years, 20 to 30 years. You need at least a whole generation. Right? Because now I've got kids. The, the, the government takes over a kid born that day, right, has now gone up 30 years of their life. They've lived in an environment where, like, okay, they have a relative degree of security. They actually trust that the police are not going to rob them. They're going to keep the, the place safe. They trust that if they earn money working, they're going to get to keep it, that they can invest it in investments that will actually play out. They don't have to worry about in massive internal corruption, right? Well, now you've got something where, okay, now I'm looking at a Caribbean nation that has some advantages that can be properly, and when I say exploited, I mean that in the positive term of, I don't mean, you know, bad, but can be utilized for the benefit of the people that live in that country, right? As well as foreign investment, tourism, and everything else. But this is, this is the question. As, as someone that, again, has very, very strong libertarian sympathies, I look at a place like Haiti right now and I'm like, I don't, I don't see how they can pull something like that off. And, and here's the thing I want people to understand about foreign aid and why I don't think it'll work. Because one, any government that comes in there and actually does what is necessary in order to do it is going to instantly be condemned by the same left-wing NGOs, the same international institutions that beg for you to come in in the first place. They're going to yell and scream that you're trying to run the country and, you know, Haiti for the Haitians and the whole deal. That's, that's what they're going to say, guaranteed. And so what are you going to do? You're going to go in there for a little while. You're going to spend a whole bunch of money. You're going to change nothing. And then you're going to leave. And they all know it. They all know it. The Haitians know it. The Haitians know you're not staying. One of, the, one of the most important aspects of training I went through as a Green Beret is we would do our scenarios when we were going through the, the Special Forces Qualification course. And we would meet up with a local rebel leader that we had to work with. And one of the first things they all said to us was, you'll be gone in two years. You'll be gone in a year. You'll be gone when this is no longer valuable for you. You'll be gone. And we had to sit there and convince them, no, no, we're, we're going to stay, even though all of history showed us that we want it. And they're like, how do you overcome that? Because that's not you. You don't control that. You're a soldier. Politicians control that. They would name out, like the, the people that were doing the role playing, they would name out specific politicians, specific environments, specific wars, specific interventions. They would say, you will, all, you will back out, and that's why we don't want to trust or work with you. And that's a, fair, that's a fair analysis. So what causes someone to actually want to work over there? Well, one, you have to actually care about the people in the country, and you have to be able to, you have to, be able to envision some sort of long-term benefit at the other side of it. There needs to be a long-term economic benefit. The United States, the UN, none of these places have real, and they don't see Haiti as an economic opportunity. They see it as a sinkhole. And they're always going to have that mindset at some point. So yeah, they might do something here or there if they find it politically advantageous at the time. But they're never going to be able to invest what's actually needed because what's needed is not just money. What's needed is the hope for an environment that can actually thrive. And the thing is, is that I could see an environment. I could see an environment where you, again, if you have enough local partners willing to work with you, you have enough foreign investment 
right? I'm not talking about foreign aid, foreign investment. Then I could see someone actually looking at Haiti as, okay, there's an opportunity here, but I don't think it ever comes. I don't think it ever comes until the very least they are secure. I'm not getting shot and having my stuff taken. And that's the part that I think is going to be really, really difficult to achieve um, on a, on a long-term basis. So intervention is uh, the, the way that it would probably happen is off the table in terms of solutions, because mm -hmm. The type of intervention that I think you're advocating for, quite frankly, I mean, our government, I don't think would be interested in. No. If we intervene, you know what would happen if we intervened? We'd go over there and then we would spend a hundred billion dollars on, you know, gender equity programs. <laughs> and somehow the money would find its way into, you know, submachine guns for gang leaders by yeah. the time we pull out. Yeah. Have you ever seen the meme that's like, my taxes look like this, that way Pakistani gender programs look like this. And it's like <laughs> nuclear weapon yeah. warheads yeah. and they're like military parades. Yeah, with the rainbow flag on them. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and again, the United States actually deployed troops to Haiti um, and the Dominican Republic. We left the Dominican Republic, I think, after like, 10 years, or we left, we left the Dominican Republic 10 years before we left Haiti. And part of the idea behind that was, is that we were actually securing U.S. economic interests, um, a well with other, you know, arguably strategic interests. Um, and, and again, you, you could well, argue. I mean, we were there in the nineties too. Yeah. But in the nineties, that was more in, in, when we were, when we went down there and I think 19, it was like prior, I think it was prior to world war one. We went down there then. It was like, we're in charge. It wasn't, it wasn't, we're, oh, we're working by through and with local officials. Like, it was more of like, no, we're, we're in charge. See all the guns? That means we're in charge. Um, but again, I, I don't, I don't see. We would not do that today. No. Joe, Joe Biden would not, he would be called a colonizer, an imperialist yeah. if we did it. I mean, a lot of our own people on the right would oppose it because they'd be like, why on why earth are we do we need it? to occupy? Yeah. And, because again, the average American on the right is probably like, well, we've got our own problem with our own border. We well, have Eric Prince, Eric Prince said this on a, on a show once. And I thought it was an interesting concept. He was talking about um, Afghanistan and he goes, what we needed in Afghanistan was a viceroy. Dude, you use that word and people are like, colonizer, right? they're furious. But he goes, what we what we needed was somebody to actually like run the government over there and, and run operations. Isn't that what Karzai was supposed to do? Well, yeah, but that's, <laughs> you know, um, and, and the, the, again, you can say whatever you want about that particular argument, but at least he was willing to have the discussion on, okay, like if you want, has anything like this been done in the past successfully? And by successfully I mean relative stability, somewhat econo economic development, economic growth. Yeah, that's been done before. Um, the problem is we look back now and that's all evil and bad and, and, but I mean, there, there's also the problem of nation building. I, yeah. I have a very, I'm so hesitant to ever endorse nation building because I, I, I mean, I, I, everybody has this idea of what it is, but like I have an America first foreign policy yeah. like through and through. I, I, I when oh, we I'm have, not a fan. So here's what I, here, I guess here's what I'm getting at. Cause I, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm suggesting something I'm not. Okay. I don't think the United States government should engage in nation building in Haiti. I think, <laughs> I think you actually need a private venture. I think if you had a private venture that actually saw the benefit, and I'm not talking about like the East India Trading are, Company. Are we going to see Prigozhin pop up I'm again not, with the, with Wagner I'm, and Haiti? I'm not. I'm not talking about. Is I'm that not, what you mean, like PMC or? I, I I think if you I think the honestly if um, well let's put it this way if if you could ensure um that because a lot of private military companies get to get titled as mercenaries and that's not actually a, a fair description of what they do. Like Blackwater was not a mercenary group. Um, if, if you actually had, let's say you had something more along the lines of a letter of mark and reprisal. So within the constitution, one of the ways that the federal government can actually fight against enemies and whatnot is through a letter of mark and reprisal. And, and some of the, one way to think of that is privateers. So you actually had, um, ships that were not necessarily military units that could arm themselves and go out and conduct operations against a particular state. So the Barbary pirates was a good example of letters of mark and reprisal. Like, Hey, you want to go after those guys? You're free to do it. Like you, you can do so with the legal backing of the United States. If you had something like a letter of remark and reprisal against something like Haitian gangs with the understanding that working by through and with the local population, you could actually set up, you know, zones or things like that where there could be economic benefit as a result. Well, now the difference is, is somebody would be looking at this from the standpoint of, okay, the economic benefit that I'm going to get from conducting this operation is built around establishing security. 
So I'm not going in there and just like taking resources and leaving because you don't got any in Haiti. You have to look at it from a long-term investment standpoint if you actually want it, wanted to have it be a, 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 an enterprise that made money, right? That actually did something. It's not like you're going to go in there and take all the Haitian gold, right? There is none. So you'd actually have to be committed to a long-term investment strategy that was rooted in this idea of being able to provide security. Of building wealth in the country. Yes. Yeah. You would have to build wealth there in order for it to be, in order for you to get a return on that investment. The issue would be is like, who would be willing to take that on um, with, with no assurance that you're not going to have a UN-backed force to come down and now overthrow you? But by the same token, how do you also monitor in such a way to where you don't allow a private company to come in and genuinely like exploit the people um, and just steal everything because they're the law of the land now? Like, yeah. you know, so how do you get that? So like traditional nation building style foreign intervention, that's off the table. We already, we already, we know nation building doesn't work, right? Like, like for the most part, for yeah. the, there, and, there are some limited, there are some limited situations historically where it has worked. Unless you occupy a country for yeah. generate, unless we do what we did with Japan. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. Or, or South Korea for that matter. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Well, and when keep in mind when we occupied Japan, yeah, they went through elections and, and they had a, a parliament and everything else, but. For a while there, Doug MacArthur was running the show. Was, was basically right? the su pseudo emperor of Japan. Yeah, yeah. this uh, this idea that we just went in and said, "Oh, you're in charge now." Okay, cool. G no. Good good elections. <laughs> no, no, that was not it. Like we had a we had a heavy influence, and, and not always not always for the best. But that was you know arguably what you could but say was necessary. Mo most Americans don't want a generational long American occupation, nation building in Haiti, and, no. and as you pointed out, it probably wouldn't work anyway. Because let's be honest, the people that currently control so many of our institutions and levers of power and have access to the money that flows through the federal budget. They're all on the left, man. Yeah. Like, like they're, they're, they, they, this is the whole cathedral concept. Like whenever we engage in certain things, this is why like people on the right need to be against further military action and intervention and nation building, because all that it does is it fuels yeah. a, a portion of the left, the left's ideological capture over our institutions. The good news is, is that once an American occupation or nation building exercise ends, like in Afghanistan, this is the silver lining of the failure in Afghanistan. Yeah. Once that ends, no amount of left-wing grifting can outlive the the complete collapse of the mission statement's own purpose, right? Yeah. Like, like you can't have gender programs for Afghanistan <laughs> when we're not in Afghanistan. Yeah. Not not even they can get away with justifying that, right? So you don't want nation building you don't want permanent american occupation it it wouldn't work it would only fuel our own ideological enemies and most americans certainly on the right don't even want it anyway so that's off the table bringing back the french is off the table no, yeah, <laughs> no, no colonization no. that's off the table and and we've gone through the political history of haiti with like they've they've gone through every type of government you can think of they've had republics they've had you know empires, free elections they've had empires monarchies just strongman dictatorships juntas. juntas they've tried Quasi Marxism. They tried socialism. They've tried, you know, gang warfare. The country had a civil war. They've invaded the Dominican Republic and been expelled in the past. Like they've done everything. They've sped run every type of government you can go through <laughs> yeah. and every type of state of affairs you could possibly go through. I think that there's something to be said about the whole private aspect of it. And I also think there's something to be said about El Salvador, because yeah. if Bukele wants to try it, quite frankly, I think that he's got he doesn't have the problem that we have in the United States where we have this Leviathan of left-wing interest groups and yeah. NGOs that feed off of the federal government's budget. And so if we were to occupy Haiti and try to do nation building, so much of that money would just be grifted through those organizations. But oh, yeah. Bukele's cleaned house. They don't have, there's no, there's no left-wing interest group that's pushing, you know, Gramscian style cultural Marxism that is just waiting for the moment. For oh money no, if, to if flow you, through. if you pay, if you were to pay El Salvador to come over there and, and run security for a time in Haiti, I guarantee you that there would be no like trans activist classes going with them, right? It would be guys with machine guns to do one purpose and that's to round up gang members and incarcerate and or kill them. That that's, that's what it would be. And you, you bring up that other point too, with these NGOs, like there, there are so many, I, I don't, when, when the history finally gets written about all of the corruption within NGOs and how so many people that understand exactly how foreign aid works, love to get out of the government and start their own NGOs in order to have billions of dollars slushed through 
Um, and you know, again, for a small fee, right? There's like, a term to describe it. People, people on the internet have coined it the global American empire, the gay. <laughs> <laughs> and the point, the, the, the point is, is that like, here, here's an example. Remember when we did that podcast about Ukraine? Yeah. And I brought up the joke about why are we spending a hundred billion dollars to queer the Don boss? That was not, <laughs> that was a joke, yeah. but that is true. Yeah. In a very literal sense, if you look at some of the military aid that we give Ukraine, a portion of the, their strings attached, just like with federal aid to states, right? Mm -hmm. So many of the strings attached, when you actually dig into the finances of the American aid to Ukraine, it's always attached to something about DEI or equity or, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, gender and, and like they're... It, it, is, it is that's it's, the main cultural export of the United States. It's right wokeism. Now. Yeah. Wokeism, wokeism is, is the, the new imperialism. Yeah. Wokeism is, 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 is the new main export of the West. It's a new, it's a, it's a form of Western American imperialism yeah. with, with each dollar comes a little bit more woke. That's, and, yeah. and so like somebody who might be sympathetic to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but is not in favor of nation building and certainly not in favor of exporting wokeism, they can look at this and be like, well, this is a huge problem. But the thing is, you can't get rid of it because, again, the left has hijacked some of these institutions and, and they've buried themselves deep When you say within, sympathetic to the, you mean sympathetic to the Ukrainians. Sympath yes, yeah, symp sympathetic to defending the Ukrainians and yeah. saying, well, we need to preserve the international order where it's not okay to invade sovereign countries yeah. because that's a problem no matter where you live. Yeah. And you're opening a can of worms. You're returning to the early 20th century. If we're going back to the conquest ethic, this gets really bad really quick. Yes. And it can escalate in a way that affects everybody. And, but then when you look at the fact that we, through the West, are exporting this horrific ideology that tears down social structures and leads to chaos and props up left-wing lunatics yeah. wherever it's implemented, like, again, the global American empire, it's a, it's a real thing. And as you said, like wokeism has become our primary export. So if anything else, you should not support an American intervention in Haiti because the last thing that the Haitians need is a bunch of money flowing to left-wing NGOs yeah. to promote, you know, transing kids in Haiti, right? Like that, that doesn't fix the chronic, you know, crime and yeah. homelessness no, nobody, and nobody poverty in, and nobody in Port-au-Prince is thinking, you know, what we really need is transgender visibility day. <laughs> like that, nobody's <laughs> thinking that right now. They're like, well, I really need these gang members to stop murdering me. That's, that would be great. No, I, I look, I, I, I think that's true. I think when we look at, you know, again, why, why does this matter? Because the United States has been involved in Haiti for well over a hundred years now. Um, it, it falls within what we generally call the American sphere of influence, uh, in our hemisphere. If you still look at like concepts of the Monroe doctrine, um, and, and obviously, you know, on, on a basic moral level, I don't want to see that sort of human suffering anywhere. Now, one of the things that is important for people to understand is that if you don't like seeing human suffering, there's always something you can do without actually engaging the United States government. And this has become a real problem whenever we look at problems and challenges is this idea that, oh, well, what's the government going to do about it? What if it's not the government's role? What if it's not the government's place to do something about it? And so... What I want people to understand with what I'm talking about here today, I, I'm not saying that I love the idea of a private military and a private company coming in and taking over a country. That is not what I'm advocating. What I am saying is that I'm, I'm using my own experience from unconventional warfare, from counterinsurgency, from you know studying the way that governments spend money, from actually being inside the government and watching how they allocate and how they distribute it. What I'm saying is I think when you look at a, a country like Haiti that, as Christian has articulated, has gone through the, in, the entire spectrum of types of government, the entire spectrum of various forms of foreign intervention, I don't see a pathway forward that just says, go in there for two years, run some elections with foreign observers, and then, when you, then you can leave and everything will be fine. I don't see that happening. I really do think if you want a safe, secure, and free environment, there's a certain philosophical foundation which is necessary, which makes it possible. The, the reason why most of the world has not been constitutional republics is not simply because everyone before us was horrible. It's because there does have to be a general commitment to certain principles in order for that sort of society to flourish. It doesn't matter how nice and cooperative and dedicated you are to property rights if your neighbor is willing to shoot you and take your stuff. You have to either have the ability to defend yourself and you have to find enough people that you're willing to work in concert with to be able to defend those principles. And when you have that, then you can actually enjoy the true benefits 
Because the bottom line is, it doesn't matter where you go, and this is not this is not some concoction of Western civilization that that sinful nature, that desire to meet our needs at the expense of others is something that all of us struggle with on some level. And when John Adams says that our constitution was only written for a moral and religious people and was totally unsuited to any other, again, it's that whole concept of self-regulation. And yes, we can, we can wax intellectual about how giving up liberty for security is a bad bet, but it's also important to remember that it's giving up essential liberty. Because I promise you right now, if someone was dragging your kids out to kill them, and you couldn't stop them, you'd be willing to give up quite a bit in that moment in order to protect them. And so in order to make sure that we don't have that sort of environment, we need that strong understanding of the sort of philosophical underpinning which makes the sort of society we want to live in possible. Because I guarantee you this much, it's not just a piece of parchment sitting at the National Archives. Without people that actually believe in those fundamental principles, it's just some really nice calligraphy. And the problem that we have right now, the problem that I think Haiti is experiencing right now is that honestly, if you're a mom, if you're a, if you're a dad down in Haiti right now, the one thing you're concerned about is how do I feed my kids and how do I keep them safe? And the question for how do you create the long-term conditions to where people can thrive in a safe environment, I don't think is easy. It's just saying more American dollars or more American troops. You have to have people that are actually committed to and believe in a long-term strategy that is going to benefit them and their country. And unfortunately, that is something that to some degree has to be an organic desire within the society you're talking about. One of the things I always got frustrated about is George Bush sending us into Iraq and then asking, where is the Iraqi Thomas Jefferson? Well, that's fascinating. You know, when the French sent troops to help with the American Revolution, they weren't wondering who the American Thomas Jefferson was. They already knew we had one. And so to some degree, to the extent that you are going to assist another nation, you better have somebody there that can actually provide organic solutions as opposed to us walking in there with a lot of guns and a lot of money thinking that that's going to be sufficient to help secure and then build back a society to where it can take care of itself. Because more often than not, what we've actually just created is perpetual dependency, not to mention a whole lot of enemies in the process. So I'm going to reject this notion that the reason why Haiti's in the situation it is right now, the exclusive reason why Haiti's in the situation is because of the West or because of the United States, and therefore we have some sort of moral or legal obligation to fix it. History shows us time and time again Solutions do have to arrive to some degree organically within a society for them to actually stick. And whereas I do think there's a role for people that have a heart for Haiti and for what's going on there to go down and assist with that, I honestly think it's time for us to stop believing that governments are always the one that solve these sorts of problems. I actually believe that there is a role for for other organizations, other institutions, whether it be elements of the church, whether it be elements of genuine charitable organizations, not ones just relying on federal dollars so that they can run it through their slush funds and go to their cocktail parties with only a fraction of it actually getting to the people that actually need it, like genuine charitable organizations. And yes, I think there's a role for the private sector when it comes to investment, because I guarantee you they would love the foreign investment, but the only way it's ever going to happen is that if it's profitable, and that's not a bad thing. I promise you, you don't like investing in companies that don't like profit. This profit's not evil. It's just a way of measuring on whether or not you're using scarce resources and goods in order to provide the sort of goods and services that people want and that actually improve their lives. And so maybe it is time that we start looking at this a little bit differently on how individuals, not governments, but how individuals, how the church, how companies might be able to help in an environment like this. But it is ultimately going to start with providing some modicum of security. So look, I hope this has been an interesting conversation. I know we've uh, we've talked about things um, from, a, from a variety of different angles, from the economic side, from the historical side, from the geopolitical side, from the NGO side, and hopefully offered up some ideas on how you might tackle a situation like this that are at least interesting to consider, right? Not, not saying everything's figured out, not saying we've solved the problem. We certainly aren't that, we're, we're nowhere near as arrogant as some of the talking heads and certainly some of the government officials that think that this is all solved within a couple years and more money. But I do think we need to start considering 
other options for dealing with challenges like this. Because if you think about most of the challenges that you face in your life, they are solved not by a politician, not by a government program, not by a whole bunch of coercive force. They're usually solved by people working in voluntary cooperation with one another. The time where the force comes into play is creating the sort of environment where those people can find each other, find a common goal, and work together to achieve it. That's how you get long-term stability. And it has to be, on some level, organic. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next episode.